My name is Patrick Rose, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And it is my pleasure to present our panel, MLS Growth Story, a conversation with Don Garber and Jonathan Kraft. Our panelists for today, as mentioned, are Don Garber, Commissioner of Major League Soccer, and Jonathan Kraft, President of the Kraft Group. Our panel will be moderated by Taylor Twoman, Lead Soccer Analyst at ESPN, and the panel will last for 45 minutes, and we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. So please field your Q&A questions on Twitter using the hashtag MLSGrowth. And today's panel is a business panel sponsored by Ticketmaster. And with the questions, um, the moderator will be fielding these questions um, that come up with the top mentions. And I hope you guys enjoy the panel for today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Taylor. Yep. One of the three people on this uh, panel is not like the other. I'll let you guys figure that out. Uh, Patrick, I appreciate the introduction. Um, to get this started, before we get into the weeds of MLS a little bit, uh, Jonathan, you've been there from the beginning, since 1996. Don, since 1999. But you were part of the group that found the gentleman to your right to be commissioner of the league. Just tell everyone that story before we get going. He already existed. I didn't <laughs> find him. But uh, Don, back in, um, I first got to know Don in the early and mid-90s. He was uh, a young, uh, very promising NFL executive and uh, had run, had been involved at NFL properties and had started the NFL experience and then was the president of NFL International or whatever your title was. And at the 1998 Super Bowl, which took place in San Diego, there was a Saturday night NFL properties party. And we both left at the same time and we were out, we were standing outside underneath one of those uh, gaslight lamps. And Don started asking me questions about MLS. And we, we, had, we had now just completed a, a couple of seasons of MLS, and our original commissioner was a good guy, but it might not have been a perfect fit. And Don started just asking questions about the league, because he, at the time, was selling NFL football to other countries around the world, and he understood sports business and sports management, and he understood the challenge of selling uh, a sport that wasn't native in a country and, and wasn't a market share leader. And I finally said, after about 20 minutes, I said, Don, you know, if we ever made a change, do you think you'd be interested? And he said, you know, he, maybe he was more interested than he let on, but he sort of <laughs> looked at me and he said, he said, that might be one of the things I would leave the NFL for, one of the few things, because I, I love the NFL. And I remember, uh, I went and I, I told my dad, my dad had the utmost respect, still does obviously, for Don. My dad had been on the NFL International Committee and he's like, oh, we gotta make that happen, he's great. And then the next time I saw Lamar, I had mentioned it to him, Robert already had, and Lamar Hunt had this twinkle in his eye. Yeah. He had to know Lamar to know, which said, you know, Lamar really liked that idea too. So it was, I'm glad Don and I walked out of that Did you party think that night you'd be sitting here 20 plus years as MLS commissioner? Pro probably not, Taylor. Yep. I mean, uh, Jonathan has such a great memory. It happened exactly like that. And it was sometime thereafter, I was at an owner's meeting and, and Robert, came up to me and, and he said to me, so I, I know you've been talking to Jonathan about this. He said, you know, what do you know about soccer? And I said, not a whole lot. He said, I, I think you'd be a great commissioner. So. <laughs> and you know what I say about Robert all the time? Generally right. Robert has the best instincts of anybody I ever know. He listens and he says, and it's always right. So and you know, I don't ever disagree with the, him. Uh, soon thereafter, it was a couple of months later and, and I ended up uh, taking the job and we have a press conference and a bunch of my NFL friends came and I remember just getting attacked by the media. You, you were yep. playing in the league at that time yep. or just about right before. to. And uh, there was a headline in the, in the LA Times saying uh, Don Garber, the wrong guy for the job. And I just remember coming home to my wife after that and saying, man, what, what did I do? Did I do? <laughs> but it's been a great ride. It's been the league is in a terrific spot, Taylor, as you know, and, and I've been honored to be able to... Well, let's talk it. about that, because MLS kicked off its 25th season, and I know you two know better than anyone in this room that there were some bumps in the road. Some would say maybe some potholes. 
Uh, but Don, when you look at your 20 plus years, what are you most proud of? Well, you know, I think it's the, the culture that sort of loves, supports, and believes in Major League Soccer throughout the U.S. and Canada, Taylor. In the early days, the, the league strategy was right. You know, how do, how do we create a professional league that would drive the growth of the sport, mm -hmm. that would lead the soccer nation concept that America that time really was ripe and ready to, uh, to believe in the sport? But boy, do we, we had enormous challenges. We had not yet figured out we needed to build stadiums. We had not yet figured out a commercial strategy. Uh, we had a handful of markets that were not really ready for uh, the game. We had to go through a reorganization, no different than any other company that uh, has enormous financial challenges. And we, we literally took a step back, the Kraft family, the Hunt family, Phil Anschutz, and got into a room and just said, the plan we're on isn't really going to work, so how do we pivot and come up with plan B and ask the owners to come up with hundreds of millions of dollars of commitments at that time, and this is 2000, 2001, invest in bu building a commercial digital media strategy, even right. back then. And the fact that that plan worked and people believe in Major League Soccer. And ultimately, that's what sports are all about. You know, you've got to have a deep emotional connection as a fan. You have to have clubs that are relevant. You have to have partners, media partners like ESPN and great corporate partners that believe in you. And that belief is very, you can't buy it. Right. You, you, like the, the movie Saving Pri Private Ryan, you got to earn it. Yep. And I think we really earned it over the last 25 years. Jonathan, for you over the 25 years, What's been the biggest surprise for you, other than Atlanta drawing 60,000 week in and week out? I, I, <laughs> That's the easiest, 70,000 some weeks. I, I don't know what the biggest surprise has been. I will say, because we're at a data and analytics conference in, in 1998 when Don and I had that first conversation, people weren't talking about sports in that context, but part of that conversation Don said, to me, this just has to work, because he was using data and analytics. He said, I just read something about how soccer is by far and away the most actively participated in sport of any in this country by our youth. People aren't participating in football in other parts of the world, and that's my biggest hurdle. So we've got the kids understanding the game. So he was, he was using data then, and I think one of Don's greatest uh, steps as commissioner involved bringing, we, 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 we had come out of the downturn where the Hunts and Phil and our family owned all the teams in the league. And we had come out of that and we were starting to get some success, but Don knew if we didn't hypercharge the momentum that we had, we might run out of steam. And so, he hired the Boston Consulting Group, and they came in, and they did a really great analysis. I think internally at the league, we had intuitively thought that the right market to appeal to was sort of that mass uh, market, middle class family with a couple kids playing soccer, and try to bring them in to be our fans. Yep. And I think we were, we were misguided. I think Don in his gut knew we were misguided, but he didn't know the right answer. So we brought in BCG, and BCG did this work, Boston Consulting Group, and they broke down the sports demographic in this country in a really great scientific way. And they basically said, you have about 35, 40% of the sports fans in this country are either what they called soccer enthusiasts or sports fans who are fans of soccer. And you haven't played to them. You've played to the suburban middle class family. You have to play to this group. And strategically, they came up with a way for us to do it. And it was very analytical. And I, just as we're at a sports and analytics conference, Don hired them. Don really, a lot of us, including me, were skeptical. And their work, I think, is what has really propelled us over uh, the last half dozen years, five, six years, and, and has us on the trajectory that we're on now. So I guess what I would say is surprising is that, you know, Don's gut on the science of this, coupled with some great work from a consulting company, really was the finishing touch 
to get us on the trajectory that the league is on now. You know, Taylor, for, for the people here running businesses and, and thinking about uh, how do you use data, how do you use right. analytics and research to try to drive a, an outcome, you know, sports leagues, by their nature, when you have a board of disparate owners who have a collective interest in the growth of the game, but they have different capacities, they're in different markets, they're in particular in our league, they've either been in for a while or they're brand new, and right. all of the, the debate about what should we do, how do we build this league, was driven by either who had the loudest voice, who had the most juice, who had the most respect because of who they were and what they have done, and getting research and, and understanding our consumer and our fan base so that we could drive decisions based on data, not by strength and power of you know, debate in the room. So as you know, met not many people, not all of them might be deep soccer fans here, how we invest in targeting money to spend on what kind of players to bring in the league. How do we get the designated players, the big name guys who are coming in from overseas and how do we fit that into our strategy? How do we invest in youth and do that in an analytical way so that we can ensure that we're making those investments in infrastructure and players and driving uh, positive economics both on the field and also in selling players. And I think it's a lesson in that sports by their nature are not what most fans think they are. Yes. You know, you really got to manage it no different than any other business. But even players have now used analytics where that was never the case. And it's not like I played 30 years ago. It's 10 years ago, you weren't using analytics. But I'm glad, Jonathan, you brought up the fact that there was a change of the quote unquote soccer culture in this country. And I want to use that because there was a recent poll that said behind American gridiron football, basketball and soccer are tied for the number two sport in our country to watch. So six years from now, you got the World Cup coming. How do you prep for that? Well, I'm, so, I'm glad you brought that up because I'll take the watching one step further. When you look at the demographics of who's watching us uh, on, on television or streaming us, just about 40%, I think it's like 39.5% uh, of that group are under the age of 40. Mm -hmm. And 40% of the fan base in total, and some of it makes are, are Hispanic. And if you talk to people about advertisers, who they want to reach, or what, what the trending demographics are in this country, it's how to get the attention of young people and how to get the attention of the growing Hispanic population. And uh, MLS is smack dab right there at the epicenter of that. And, and I think that's why we're so bullish. But if we hadn't done the work that we did to up the quality of play in our league, um, I think I, I, I'm not sure we would be where we are today. And the last thing I would say to that is we conducted some research and we asked different age demographics how they viewed the quality of play with an MLS. And baby boomers, who probably know the least about soccer, but have a perception of Major League Soccer that goes back to the beginning, rated us just acceptable. It was a scale of one to 10 where five would be acceptable. They rated us a, a tick over five. But Gen Z and millennials rate us 40% higher north of seven and, and with the momentum going up. And, and, and that's great because we're credible to young people who love soccer. We're credible in the Hispanic community. And now it's our job to be respectful of that momentum and not, not mess it up. Don, how do you use these analytics, the data, to prep for the World Cup in 2026 to come here? Because you, Jonathan, you saw 1994 World Cup, what it did for the sport. I mean, it's hard to not look at the next five, six years and say, if you prep for that moment, what this sport's ultimately going to look like. You know, it's interesting, I, I don't really think of data and, and the work we're doing in that front necessarily just as it relates to 26, okay. because I think if the league continues to grow, gets more popular, we have more teams that matter and are relevant in the communities, then we're going to be in a great spot when the World Cup comes to capitalize on this incredible global event so that in 27 and beyond, 
we're in a bigger, better, more powerful position than we are today. You know, most businesses, particularly people who are sitting in the room, most people don't know exactly where they're going to be in 2026. Right. You're going to ask Second Spectrum, a, a company we just did a deal with, yep. what are they going to look like six years from now? They could probably guess, but they couldn't literally tell you in a moment in time. We know in 2026, in the summer of 26, the World Cup will be in North America, Canada, United States, and Mexico. We'll have at least 30 teams. We'll have a new media deal. We'll have our, our players who are going to be more important and connected to new groups of fans. And if we do all the work that that data and innovation is going to help sort of drive, then we'll be in a great position to capitalize. Will the revolution be playing in a stadium? And yes. Tom Boston by then? Yes. <laughs> they'll be playing in a stadium. You didn't say they'll be playing, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be in a soccer stadium. It only took stadium. me about eh, 15 minutes, but that's there, Well, you said, will they be playing in a stadium? <laughs> the, the, the one thing I would just add to what Don said, because I think, Taylor, when you talk historically, the 94 World Cup was a milestone. The, the goal originally, for Alan Rothenberg and the other founders of MLS was that uh, when the 94 World Cup happened that MLS would have already been solidified, meaning it was going to launch the next year, and it wasn't. And, and even for our family that was strongly inclined to go in, it took the event of the World Cup to really get us to understand. And uh, my, I remember my dad and I had never been to an international soccer match before that mattered. We had been to a friendly, but not one that mattered. And we owned the old Foxborough Stadium. And we, we, we went, and I remember my, my father looking at me and saying, this is amazing. Look, look at the cross section of humanity that's here and the energy that's created by the competition on the field and the feelings of nationalism. And that's what sold us on going into the league. And I think in a lot of respects, the 2026 World Cup, if MLS continues to do its job, can be at the other end of the spectrum. It can be what takes this league that at that point in time will be north of 30 years old and will have at least 30 teams in it. And it can be maybe what really just permanently launches us above what, what people have historically thought of as the established sports in this country. And I, I, because so many more people will be exposed to it. And the one other cool thing I would say, and, 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 and I keep mentioning Robert, but he's here today. He's the honorary chair of the 2026 World mm -hmm. Cup. And the idea of doing it with Canada and Mexico with the US, that broadens that theme of what soccer is all about. It's not owned by any one country the way you know professional football is or the way professional basketball had historically been to the last couple decades. And it was really his, he's like, we should make this a multi country regional event and just raise the specter of it. And you can't do that in too many other sports. No, you That's really hard. can't. You really can't because yeah. the sport ultimately around the world is inclusive, not exclusive. And that's what the uniqueness of 26 is going to be. I, I don't want to bore anyone in here, but I do need to ask both of you. You know, this CBA conversation is always a part of other sports. And the previous two went down to the wire, yet this one didn't. Don, I'm going to start with you. One, it's extremely important that it got done, but how did it get done so quickly and easily with the Players Association? Well, you know, I'll chat about it, and Jonathan's on our, uh, our Labor Committee, so he could talk about it as well. It's all about everything else that I think we think about, Tara, when we're managing the league, yep. about preparation, and it's about effective communication and good planning. So the, the planning and prep started a year ago. Okay. The discussions with the union continued over the last 12 months. So by the time you get down to the wire where the season's over, you have an expiration of the agreement. You know what the issues are. You're prepared with your ownership. The union was prepared with a, a more professional and I, I think a more systematic approach to how they were communicating with their players. We knew what the key issues were, and we basically, like you always do, you lock yourself yep. in a room in a lawyer's office, and we were able to get it done 30 days before the start of the season. It is our 25th season. We have Nashville and Miami coming in. We have six teams, including them, coming in over the next couple of years. We have a, a run-up to our new media deal, so it was really important to all of us. Our players, who are our partners, as well as our ownership and our clubs, that we were going at this together with, uh, with some great runway. 
I, I think Don just summarized he said it, best. it really, really well. And the only thing he didn't say is he, I mean, he said it started 12 months ago. I would argue that after our last labor deal, and this is a lesson for anybody who might want to go into the sports business or any business for that matter, Don and Mark Abbott realized that the idea of basically having no communications for four years and then getting around a table and having to try to start a negotiating relationship wasn't constructive. And I think Don and, and Mark Abbott spent a lot of time as soon as the last deal got done uh, building a relationship with our players union and hearing things that were of importance to them and them understanding the important uh, business objectives the league had and how we could work together to achieve them so that when the negotiations started or the formal labor challenges and we had enormously challenging negotiations. I think there's a different dynamic that exists between the player pool and ownership in sports today. I think players are more sophisticated. They understand their role in building the, the asset, if you will. And if the asset continues to grow and there's more revenue coming in, in all leagues, players yeah. benefit by that. I had breakfast yesterday with an NBA player uh, who uh, just absolutely impressed me with his understanding of the sports business, his understanding of he's a key investor in sports technology. Uh, he's the president of a, of a labor union. And man, his sophistication just absolutely blew me away and was not the way I think players were thinking about their relationship with their employer, who now is a partner years ago. I think that also goes to, and I want to move this to fan engagement as the microphone comes on, perfect time. Mm. But you talk about the evolution of the athlete becoming smarter, for lack of a better word. I was on every channel on ESPN telling you two and telling MLS that Atlanta United's not going to work. It is not going to happen. There's no way that market, the way they supported the Braves, blah, 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 blah. And yet, they're drawing 70000 a week. It's in their culture, their music culture. I want to start with you, Jonathan, because having played for your family, you and your father, it, you guys are very good at picking out little things that that market has done in other markets. Are you surprised at all at Atlanta? Or am I off base a little bit? I think what Atlanta really had going for, um, I'm not, well, yes, I was surprised at the level of success. But I think what Atlanta has going for it is a relatively young, diverse community with a killer venue in an urban setting. And, and then Arthur Kind of like Boston. Kind of like Boston, yeah. except they have yep. more land than Atlanta. <laughs> and, and, and Arthur Blank put a team together of people. He saw an opportunity. The other sports teams in that town did not have passionate, vibrant followings. And he knew there were a lot of transient people in the town. He yep. had done mm -hmm. his homework. And they probably didn't have a soccer team. So he hired a great group of soccer professionals and marketing professionals, and he built a culture and a brand before the team ever stepped on the pitch. And, and so when the team stepped on the pitch, and they were, especially they were competitive out of the gate, it was just like this unleashed energy, and it became the really cool thing to do with the millennial, Gen Z, transient, people of Atlanta and it, it, it didn't hurt that the, you know, the dome, the Mercedes-Benz yep. dome there is stadium because it's called the stadium, was just a great place uh, to watch. And they So what do you do athletes. for the Revs? What, what, do you, what have you well, learned? Because you were there in 96 and like I said, there was bumps in the road. But now you see the LAFCs, the Atlanta Uniteds. Have you learned anything from those newer teams? Yeah, and I, I think we wrestle all the time with, do we act on it when we're at Gillette, when there's no public transportation to our matches, yep. and you, you just because of the nature of an open-air NFL football stadium, you can't create what's gone on there. I think in our minds, we have a lot we want to do with the branding and the fan experience that really can't happen 
till we come to the city. Mm -hmm. So what we've said is we do want our fan base to develop that excitement. We had always thought we would wait to do things like a training facility because we thought maybe we'd build one in the city when we built the stadium. We decided a year and a half ago, two years ago, that couldn't wait. So we built a standalone training facility that opened about six months ago. $35 million training facility that he waited 10 years till I retired. But anyways, <laughs> carry on, Jonathan. Appreciate that. Thank we, you. We, 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 uh, well. Yeah, well, it is what it is. I get it. I'm they, don't, they don't score goals as well as Taylor did, so we needed to build this to develop yeah. some goal scorers. And, and, and so we, we've done that, and we also thought we wanted to wait on certain things with our player acquisition strategy and just our family talked and we decided the, the soccer side of the things, the football side of the house, we had to step up the investment in. When we come into the city, I think you'll see the brand and the way we market the team mm -hmm. and what we try to create in the venue, that will be very different than what exists at Gillette. And we will, we will definitely take a lot of what we've seen at LAFC and Atlanta and, and what we've seen in other cities and bring it here and try to improve on it. Boston's a great sports town, yeah. but we have, to, we have to be accommodating to the sports fans. We can't make it difficult for them. So Taylor, I, the Atlanta story I think is a, a great lesson in no matter what business you're leading and no matter what position you're in, I think a lot of leaders think they have all the answers and you gotta realize that many if not most of the time, you don't. You know, Arthur, that project was almost 10 years of discussions and he kept on saying to all of us, including to the Crafts and the Hansai, I really think that uh, soccer and MLS could make it in Atlanta. And we all in the industry had questions about that, uh, the support for the sports teams in that community. And Arthur kept on saying to us, it's gonna be great and it's gonna be right. And they had years to build it. And obviously uh, they're, they're a spectacular success. But when you look around the league, uh, there are many, many teams that in their own communities have done things to sort of get it right because they've done the work to sort of build a fan base. LAFC, if you talk to their marketing people, they had this philosophy. It was going to be fan by fan and block by block. And they literally went out almost in street war and building pockets of fans so that those fans ultimately would believe in the team and then be connected to LAFC and then take almost ownership of what the team's success uh, could mean to them as soccer fans. And I was at the game this weekend. Yep. It, it is absolutely Unique breathtaking what's going on Absolutely. in downtown Los Angeles. I think you're going to see this in Miami where they had thousands and thousands and thousands of people watching in watch parties throughout Miami. And that wasn't something that just happened. The team organized those parties. In Minnesota and Kansas City, Midwestern cities that didn't have a lot of soccer history, it's certainly a case of Kansas City, you know, those games have been sold out since they built their stadiums and there's a cultural a relevance to them with game rituals and the relationship that players in the club have with all the soccer fans and sports fans as we've talked about those two BCG fan segments. And this business is about hard work. You know, you can't just open up your stadium, turn on the switch and put it on ESPN, Fox or Univision and expect to build a fan base. It literally requires enormous capacity and focus and strategic sort of initiatives. Speaking about the staying with the fan engagement conversation, we see so much conversation, a lot of it on, on my network, of the engagement of the African-American fan, both in the NFL and the NBA. Um, I think our sport has a Hispanic part to that. But my question is for both of you, and Don, I'll start with you. How does MLS get the African-American and Latino Hispanic fan more engaged or believing more in the product for lack of a better you know, question? Years ago, we would target the specific demographics, you know, yep. young people or Hispanics or uh, the African-American community. Today, we target young people, young people who have an engagement and connection with the game that it doesn't really matter what their race is and we want to be as inclusive and diverse in terms of how we think about our fan base, Taylor. But the young man who just introduced us, yep played soccer, youth soccer, 
He is a huge MLS fan, happens to be an African-American guy. Yep. And I'm thinking about him as an MLS fan, regardless of his race. And I think that's a unique way that we're going about building relationships and growing a fan base. And when you think about in Atlanta, where they're trying to be culturally important and having Waka Flocka be a big fan, mm -hmm. happens to be there's a hip hop culture in Atlanta, happens to be an African-American guy, and they have a large African-American contingency to their fan base. But we want fans. And we believe that America and Canada are, are just breeding people that are connected with the game. If we give them the right stadium location, the right brand, the right quality of play, the right marketing and going to where they want to be, which generally is consuming on their mobile device, we're going to grow a fan base and we're going to be in good shape. Right. Yep. There you go. That's why he's the commissioner. <laughs> and I... <laughs> That's why he's the commissioner. That was perfectly stated. Uh, you're obviously an owner of the Patriots as well, so I want to move this to kind of the tech part of the conversation with MLS versus the NFL and how analytics has been different uh, between the two leagues. What can you elaborate on that? Um, the, we, on the, on the soccer side of the house, we hired our first data analyst uh, over a decade ago. I think we might have been the first team in the league to have one. And today, we have a number of people who sit there. And more and more tools have come along now in soccer. Agreed. So we're tracking every player's movement on the field, how passes are made, how teams perform in the different thirds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ten years ago, that didn't exist, so we were creating, we would have a data analyst watch it, chart it, and then start to analyze it. Today, we've worked with our players, we're collecting information in real time, and, and coaches, there are some coaches who still believe, I like what my eyes see, and then you have other coaches who say, I want as meticulous of, and detailed of a uh, data breakdown of how the opponent I'm about to play passes the ball, where they're effective, where they want, so I can coach our guys up and then self-scouting yourself so that you can get better. We've been more heavy on the data side, I think, than some teams in soccer have been. And even Bruce Arena, who's our coach, who might be an old school coach, he believes in the value of it. On the football side of the house, um, data doesn't get used as much in charting the play-by-play -play stuff. I know people talk about it all the time. It's still, it still really doesn't. You might look at certain tendencies and other things and, and, and probabilities around certain decision right. tools. But I would say that in football, it's, it's one of a number of ingredients that goes into a game plan. Whereas in soccer now, for coaches who believe in it, I think it might even be the primary, one of the two or three primary drivers of how a game plan uh, gets well, created. Well, years and ago at this conference where it. Liverpool came in and they talked about how okay. the data drove that and their success and it's changed. And, and, look, and look what Liverpool's done. Great. And what, what kind of owner are you? And I'll tell you, with? Mike Gordon, who's yep. the real brains behind what's gone on at Liverpool and, and gets no credit for it. And that's not taking away from the people who do. I think he chooses not to. He's a Boston guy and I love him. He was talking about this a long time ago and his partners, John and Tom and everybody else believe in it. But Mike has really driven that and he hired people on the football side who believed in his vision. And you see they're running away like you've never seen uh, yep. a side run away with. What kind of owner are you, old school or new school? Do you like the data or no? I think that that data in any business with anything you're doing should be a part of your decision-making tools. I think if you want to use a football coach like Bill Belichick, who's coached football for 40 years, you might not call it data, but he's got a steel trap for a mind and every instance of everything he's ever seen, he won't call it data and he won't call it machine learning, but his brain but is a is. machine and it is machine learning. <laughs> yep. So you can call it old school coaching. Uh, Bill <laughs> probably wouldn't like it called machine learning, uh, but y you know, that's effectively what it is. And I think if you're not open to at least understanding everything that's out there 
and deciding what works right for you, then you're putting your team in whatever sport you're coaching at a competitive disadvantage. We got about four or five minutes before we answer some questions from there. I'm going to move this to the media side of things. Don, I think MLS has been a real innovator in the digital media uh, world. I, I think a big part of it is because the fans and the youth of that. What, What's been the strategy behind that, and how can you even improve on that if you can at all? You know, it's, it's interesting, Taylor. I, I think all of us in the industry are not thinking about media as traditional or digital. We're thinking about it as media overall. You know, we're producing content, either it's our games or it's content that we're producing for the right. ESPNs of the world and studio shows like your new yep. studio show to try to connect with consumers that ultimately want it when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you start thinking about the future of our industry, which has been driven by the revenues primarily from media partners, uh, our future is, is really bright. And uh, I think all the disruption in this space, which is leading to new services that are looking for a direct relationship with the consumer, that consumer has a desire to consume content, whether that's a game or it's produced content, and it's giving them that relationship so they can do many other things, no different than when a cable operator was mm -hmm. looking to get that relationship so that they could sell a number of different services, whether it's more channels or recently or the last number of years, you know, internet access. So ultimately, all of this, I think, is going to be great for those of us that are in the live content business. I'll save you the next question on your list, which is our deal is up in 2020. Right. So how does that impact could, that deal? could not be more bullish about the aggregation of all of our games and all of the content that we've been producing, which represents about 25% of our media revenue, comes from content we're producing and selling to the Twitters and the Facebooks and even the ESPNs uh, of the world because it's providing them with a perspective uh, entirely digitally and back behind the scenes and studio shows that ultimately they can't produce on their own or don't have the access on their own. And it's forcing us to think differently about how do we provide access to our players and how do we have studios within our stadiums that can produce and push that content out. Ultimately, I think all of us in our business are gonna be in pretty good shape in the years to come. Yeah, I think the, the one other thing I'd layer on to what Don said, and I think this applies across all sports, is, and, and it very much involves data, is that any deal that gets done going forward from this point on is gonna contemplate within the media deal how in-game proposition wagering is handled. And there's a lot of data and science that goes into that because any league that wants to take full advantage of that has to be collecting in real time data from the field. And then that data from the field gets processed through algorithms and you can't have latency because latency can change things as people put, are putting money down. And, and, and the engagement of those proposition bets either streaming down a side of the screen or as a crawl on the bottom and you'll have some type of interactivity I think that'll bring people further into the game, um, but is gonna require us to get even better at collecting data from the field so that we can create very interesting and unique proposition uh, bets. And soccer, as a continuous flow game, as opposed to something like football or baseball where there's a break between plays, and it's the ultimate continuous flow game because we never stop. Um, I think poses unique challenges, but if we're able to solve it, poses a great opportunity because you're not ever breaking from the action. And I think the younger demographic wants that. And if we can layer on a whole other stack of other action, including the game action on top of it, we're gonna have uh, a home run from a media perspective to use a baseball analogy. We've had pretty good uh, engagement on Twitter, so I think we should go there uh, to answer some of the questions. Don, I'll start with this one. Uh, you look around the, the partnership of the NBA, WNBA, will MLS look to partner at some point with the NWSL? You know, it starts with four of our teams are already, yep. owners are already involved in owning teams in the NWSL. I'm a big believer in 
women's soccer, both as a, uh, a responsibility for the professionals to come together and continue to lead uh, the sport as we lead up to 2026. I think with their new commissioner, you'll probably see a closer okay. relationship between our league and, and that league. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in it for a wide variety of reasons. So uh, for those of you who might have asked, uh, yep. I think you'll see some good things in the future. This is for both of you. Uh, do you view European soccer leagues like the Premier League as competition or an ally in building fandom in the United States? Jonathan, I'll start with you. Um, it's a good question. Want me to read it again to give you a... No, I got it. No, I got it. I'm trying to think. I don't think we view them as competition. I think we view... I think we view something like the Premier League as as something that we aspire to, certainly their quality of play. And we're not going to be at that level anytime soon. But I'll, in terms of at the top of the table, the one thing I think we have over the Premier League or the Bundesliga or Serie A is that the, the difference in quality from our top team to our bottom team is much more compressed. Like we've had... In the last dozen years, I think we've had like 10 different champions, maybe nine. But you know, that, that type of, um, that type of parody. parody, thank you, doesn't exist in those other leagues. So I think I like our competitive model and we just wanna, we, look, we aspire to the top of what those other big leagues are, and I think they they provide us inspiration. And to the extent young people in this country are watching those leagues and and seeing what soccer is and then at, at its highest highest level and watching us and pushing us to get better, it's all good. It's definitely not. A what bad. about you, Don? So you know, Taylor, I think it. The, the growth of the, the game professionally is good for Major League Soccer as well as it's good for the NWSL. We did our research, Jonathan talked about so sports fans who like soccer and soccer enthusiasts, and those are people who have watched a professional game. The stat that you said on soccer being one of the more popular uh, uh, sports among young people, that's not just Major League Soccer, that's watching our national teams, it's watching the women's game, it's watching the Premier League or the Bundesliga or anybody mm -hmm. else professionally. So as we try to create a soccer culture in our country of people who are following the game professionally, more is better, and that puts uh, gives us the opportunity to give them a local experience. Great teams in great stadiums, centrally located with an attractive product that could connect them with a fan in their hometown. The Premier League, even though the La Liga might want to do this, yep. the Premier League is not going to be playing their games in the United States. They're playing their games in England. So the New England Revolution have to spend their time not worrying about Liverpool, but worrying about how do they yep. get more fans of the revolution, and it's easier to get somebody who is engaging in the professional game from abroad than it might be to turn a baseball fan into being a soccer fan or a fan of your local team. So I look at this at a macro level. Yep. That being said, I do have concerns. We're running, we're running a business here, right? and I'd like to be sure that we have the opportunity to continue to do that in a way that delivers for our owners who have invested billions and billions and billions of dollars in building their clubs and communities, you know, if they get a deal done here, they're gonna invest a half a billion dollars in a stadium yep. and have to put it on land that the city or the state's gonna have to provide to them. That's not coming for free. So we're all kind of integrated in ensuring that we are committed to ensuring that we could build our soccer business here. Part of that business acumen that you talk about over the last 14, 16 months, you have said this is now, we wanna sell players. We wanna put players in those big leagues. Is that a part of it, Don, though? Because as some Premier League fans may not watch MLS, if they're not watching an MLS player playing there, yeah, that sells your this product. This is something tell you remember it? this. It was one of the more difficult you know, parts of your career. You know, yes. young guys are growing up. They're playing in our league. They might want to go over 
overseas. They're contracted. You in particular had a huge following. You were the star of the team. You were the hero of the New England Revolution. So years ago, you know, me personally, I thought, you know, we need to have all of our best young players and certainly our best American players playing here. As the league matured, and I will say, we are one of the top leagues in the world, and it is a matter of how are you measuring it. Our relevance, the, the strength of our ownership group, the kind of stadiums we have, the passion of our fans. The attendance. All those things, the attendance that we have. And there are a number of things that go into that. And, and the investment in players when you're spending $250 million on a team in Manchester United, mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine that that team is going to be as competitive as what an MLS team who's spending dramatically less than that. So today, as we're part of the soccer ecosystem globally, we have to start selling players that we're developing in our academies. These guys have $30 million invested in a facility, two, three, four, five million dollars invested in their academies. At some point, yep. owners are coming to me and say, hey, this is a good idea, Chief, but you know, we gotta get some return on this. And that return is investing in growing homegrown players, playing them on your team, and then ultimately selling them overseas. And the, the one thing I would add to what Don just said is as we get more successful in developing young players in our markets as homegrowns, and you take the young athletes who choose to stay with soccer because they can be in an MLS's academy system, and they were athletic enough to play basketball or baseball or something else and potentially um, get to higher levels. If young, if, if we are able to start um, having assets go to the big five leagues mm -hmm. overseas and earning big salaries over there, it's going to change the mindset of the youth in this country who have options. And the more of them that stay with soccer, the better it's going to be for MLS and just the sport of soccer in general, because the quality of play will just continue to grow. It'll help our national team, et cetera, et cetera. Well, et cetera. the kid from FC Dallas, who two weeks ago gave up a scholarship to go to Clemson to play football and soccer, then starts for FC Dallas as a homegrown player. I think that's the trend you're going to see, in large part because Christian Pulisic is playing at Chelsea, and Alfonso Davies, an MLS homegrown, is now playing for Bayern Munich. So that's why I think a lot of these questions are pertaining to that. I'm gonna move on to the next one because of expansion, and we've got time here. Once MLS hits 30 teams in 2022, will the league rethink its single entity structure and business model? I'm, gonna, how many, how many I'm just going to answer. I'm going to answer that. We're not rethinking our single entity business <laughs> model and structure. We all. Next question. We all. The, the the operating agreement for Major League Soccer was written right over at in the financial district of this city. It was challenged in federal court in Boston, and we won. And it really is, I think, the underpinning. It's the only reason this league has survived until now. So I think people are confused to what the single entity structure is. It, it's a corporate structure that allows our owners to be equal partners in a business and make strategic decisions like, do we have designated players and how do we manage that? Do we have allocation of, of money so that teams can sign players that are strategically important to them? How do we structure ourselves commercially so that we're all trying to compete against outside competition as opposed to inside competition. The, you know, MLS is not telling Bruce Arena who to sign in New England. I could assure you that. No. And every team is making those decisions on their own to fit the character and, and the brand that they're trying to play. And I think the fan is somewhat confused by that. So the structure will never, if you were gonna ask the NFL owners today, could they if single 100 years ago, could they, would they want a structure like ours? They'd all raise their hand and say, yes. why don't we think about that 100 years ago? Uh, I'm gonna stay with that kind of conversation because the next question I find very interesting uh, for the growth of the sport, but also developing the American player. Does MLS think of you soccer around the country in markets that don't have an MLS team? Mm. Or is that U.S. soccer's responsibility? Well, I'll start. You know, U.S. soccer's got to do a better job uh, figuring out the youth development system because the system that we have now is not effective and it's not been productive. And that's not their fault. It's not necessarily something you could solve today without understanding how it all was started many, many years ago. Too many kids who want to, ha want to play can't afford to be uh, to play because they're not in the right training environments. 
the issues of high school soccer and college soccer continue to weigh and have an effect on our ability to develop players compared to the rest of the world. We said as a league, we're not really going to think about what U.S. soccer wants to do. We are going to take responsibility, at least in our own markets, to develop academies. It's now north of $100 million a year that we're investing in the development of players, and that ultimately will have players play for our teams, maybe get sold abroad, but regardless, they're mostly American citizens, yes. and therefore they'll be able to be uh, qualified to play for our national team, and the same in Canada. Outside, our, now we have 30 teams in a lot of markets soon, and outside of that, those markets ultimately have the ability, at least our clubs, have the ability to go into those markets and train those players, have access and rights to those players, uh, and they can fall into the MLS training ecosystem. But the development of youth players at eight, nine, ten years old has to get better if we want to be a more powerful, successful national team. Would you agree with that? I agree 100%. Because the truth uh, for you, looking at the revs, how do you look at a youth playing in Providence or in Southington, Connecticut, for that matter? Well, we, we've, we've ta we have a young man on our team now who I believe has played for the U.S. U19 a number of times, Isaac Anking, and he is from Greater Providence, and yep. we found him... I'll say four years ago, maybe five years ago, and brought him into our academy program, developed him, and he's a very good player. He will see time. He will get minutes on the pitch with the big club this year. Uh, but he's been in the U19 camp for the U.S. national, the U.S. U19 national team, and you know he's got a, a bright future. We've developed other players through our academy, like Scotty Caldwell and Diego, but. We actually, and you know, we, we, the, the last week or two weeks ago, uh, my dad visited a, a baseball facility in Dorchester, and he said to the guy, he was getting young kids who were good athletes, he said, why aren't we doing soccer? And, and why aren't you doing soccer? The guy said, I don't know, why aren't you? We need a field. And I think we might be solving that issue. Yep. Uh, and we, we need to, we're, we want to take kids from all over the region who have the potential and, as importantly, the desire to be really good. And not all of them will become great pros, but the one thing MLS clubs can do and U.S. soccer can do as we build the ecosystem is there are more scholarship soccer players in this country than any other sport. It's a great avenue to help young people get a college education, too. So while we really, you know, you'll hear about the guys developed at the tippy top of the food chain, a bunch of other people will come through the system who will have their lives changed by the game of soccer and, and Major League Soccer. We've got about two minutes left. Uh, Jonathan, I'll start with you. MLS's 50th year anniversary, what will the league look like? And will there be a Taylor Twelman statue at the new stadium? I don't know who wrote that in there, but. I, <laughs> I hope I'm alive to see it. As Don Thanks said, I'm not, I'm not good at prognosticating to that level. And um, what I will say is Taylor Twellman will be memorialized <laughs> in some way, shape, or form when we get our new soccer state. Don, 25 years from now, what will this league look like? You know, I was, we have 43 seconds, and commissioners always learn, let your owners have the last word. Yep. So, uh, you know, listen, we'll be, we'll be bigger, we'll be more, more important, I think we'll be more, uh, even more relevant in our local markets, Taylor. You know, I, I don't think of it in, in that time frame. I do think about it between now and 26, and we've talked about that. You know, this league has got enormous momentum, and that momentum is going to be driven both by what's happening today and think about six new teams in three years. What league has onboarded that number of teams in that short period of time? Seven new stadiums, you know, starting with zero, and, and by 2023, 24, maybe eight new stadiums if we include uh, New England in there. I mean, that's a remarkable amount of growth in a short period of time. We're going to focus on and be sure we get and all I that And I am right. going to get the last word because you just walked through that, and I think it's important to point out, and we are the only professional sports league in this country, and it's soccer in the United States, and we're at 30 teams and all these, never had a team go bankrupt. Every other sports league has, we have not. So. Don Garber, Jonathan Kraft, everybody. Thank you.